us today. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Matt Jacobson. I am the online learning coordinator for the Learning Technology Center of Illinois. And um, I'm joined today by Mr. Brian Bates, who is our director for professional learning, and Ben Sangroth, who is our lead regional ed tech coordinator for the Northern Region. Um, like to remind everybody before we get started that we are recording the webinar today. Recordings will be posted on YouTube within 24 to 48 hours of the close of this recording. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to uh, interact with us in any way, please feel free to type your questions or comments in the chat uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, make sure that the little blue box next to the word two uh, says everyone. Uh, click the little drop down arrow to change that to everyone so that we can all read your questions and benefit from the answers. You can also use the Q&A button if you would prefer. Uh, like to remind everyone that uh, professional development credits will be issued for live attendance only today. The evaluations will be uh, mailed out to you. I should say requests for evaluations will be mailed out to you within 24 to 48 hours of the close of this uh, event as well. Um, okay, I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, today, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, Ben Sangroth will be uh, letting us know what is new with Google uh, here in the fall of 2021. So without further ado, Ben, uh, I'll stop sharing and you can take it away. All right. Thank you, Matt. Hi, everybody. Ben Sangroth here as Matt uh, introduced me. Happy to be with you this afternoon on our shortest day of the calendar year. Uh, I didn't realize that when Matt and I scheduled the date that we're here to celebrate the winter solstice the worst of the solstices, in my opinion, because, you know, winter. Um, and, uh, but we are gonna be talking about something that is exciting uh, and is not cold, dark, and dreary. Uh, we're gonna be talking about Google updates and some new stuff that Google's released over the last, say, few months. Uh, we're kind of going back in time, actually, a little bit uh, even longer than that to some of these updates, but they're ones that, as I've kind of worked with teachers over the course of the you know, start of the school year into the fall into the end of the first semester. Now, I found that they're unaware that these things, some of these things actually exist. So uh, in the chat, I'm going to drop in the bit.ly for today's session. So you guys can have access to it. There will be a link, uh, a couple of slides down uh, to a Google Doc that you'll be able to uh, take advantage of. And if you're on your computer and you want to play along with some of the updates that are inside of Google, uh, you know, or it's just a nice little keepsake uh, to be able to kind of go back to uh, and interact with and kind of do some of the updates and the, they're a little bit of a challenge, if you will, uh, to those. So, um, so yes, yeah, so we're going to go. We cleverly named this, hey, Google, what's new? Because if you have a Google Home device, you know, that's how you ask it a question. So that's the hence the title to this. Uh, and if you have a young one at home, like I have a four year old and he just yells, hey, Google, all the time over and over and over and over again, especially when you hook all of your Christmas lights up to it. So then you have a strobe light effect of your Christmas lights from time to time when he starts to get a little antsy turning them on and off, but all in good fun. So um, so that's the, that's the genesis behind the title there. So as Matt said, my name is Ben, uh, lead regional ed tech coordinator uh, for the LTC, make my home up here in the LTC North. Uh, and I am currently coming to you from Sterling, Illinois, live in Dixon. Uh, all of my contact information is here should you want to reach out and ask a question or follow up with anything uh, after the event today. I'm always happy to help no matter what part of the state you're in, uh, provide support in all things technology. But, you know, I'm a Google guy, Google certified trainer now for like seven years, I think. I can't even remember. Uh, just kind of eat, sleep, live and breathe Google. Uh, and so this is really a, a fun thing for me to always talk about, to talk about the new updates, the new things that are coming out and the ways that Google is innovating and going about changing the game as far as uh, technology goes and Google, uh, just in general, the Google tools go. Um, 
one of the things that's always interesting about Google and something that I'm sure everybody on this webinar has experienced is that they're constantly evolving and constantly updating. So for example, actually, before I even share my screen, you might have noticed that this is no longer in Google Slides. This isn't even a part of the slide deck. Um, this used to be present, and now it says slideshow with a little like play button next to it. That's an update. They just made that like, I think like last week or the week before, I think I noticed it. They're always tweaking and doing new stuff to kind of throw everybody off, I think, from time to time. But it also keeps us that teach this type of stuff gainfully employed. So we are happy with it. Um, and we appreciate the updates. And there's a reason behind the updates as well. Um, when I was actually at a talk at Google, one of the things that they said is that their their app developers, their their Chrome engineers, their Google Apps for Education, and or not Google Apps for Education, their Google Apps engineers, their developers, their innovators, the people that work at Google, the Googlers themselves, they are encouraged, not mandated necessarily, but encouraged. And by the looks of it, it seems like it might be more of a a mandated thing. Uh, they have to have a new version of Chrome out every six weeks and a new refreshed version of Google Apps out every six months. And so it's not major overhauls, but that's a that's a reason why you're seeing all these updates, because Google has the mission of being innovative, of pushing boundaries, of pushing things out and getting things going. And it shows by their constant innovation and their constant updating. So I think we can take that example into education as well, that, you know, we want to keep pushing our students, we want to keep pushing ourselves to be innovative and new and do new things, and because that's where the business Business world is that's where the tech place is that's where the world is as as a thing so um, you know we want to want to keep looking towards those and, and, and recognize that so all right so let's get into some of this stuff so the first two here I actually have I am rarely disappointed in Google they, they have done numerous things that have benefited my life but this is a bit of a disappointment so the two classroom updates uh, I created this slide deck you know a couple of months ago and when I was first to put this together I thought oh this, you know, when these got announced back in February, these updates were announced. They said, coming later this year. Well, here we are. We are literally at the end of the year and they still aren't out. So I want to show you because Google's given us the gifts of them, but we don't have access to them. I actually just went into classroom today just to double check that to see if we had access and it still doesn't exist. But there are two very cool updates that are coming out next, well, some point, uh, you know, I was gonna say later this year, but it's the end of the year in seven days. So who knows, or I guess 10 days. But one of the things that's coming, this is a super important uh, update, I think, for a lot of teachers that have been clamoring for this for a while. And it's the ability to schedule assignments across multiple classes in Google Classroom. So previously, if you wanted to schedule an assignment to say to go out on Monday, you could only do that one class at a time. There are a few hacks that you could do where you could reuse the post and things like that. But if you wanted to have it scheduled out, you could only do that for one class at a time. You can see in the GIF here that there is uh, an update coming to Classroom to allow you to schedule it out across multiple classes and actually at multiple different times as well. So that's going to be really cool. Not here yet, but coming soon. So that's a really exciting update that I know a lot of teachers are anxiously awaiting and, and I am too. I'm really kind of I'm, I'm bummed that it has not happened yet this year. The next one, this is also another one that is one of those things that is coming like soon, they said later this year and here we are again, the end of the year it's not there but it's going to be really great when it does. You're going to get a new tab in Google Classroom. This is across all divisions of it. It's, you know, the education standard all the way up to education plus. Um, you're going to be able to look at the activity of your students inside of Google Classroom. So as you can see in the GIF that's playing on the screen right now, you're going to be able to look at when your students actually engaged with different assignments. So did they open that up? Did they, when did they submit it? When did they unsubmit it? And you don't have to go and kind of dive in deep to find these analytics. Like it's going to give you these things. It's going to measure them out and it's going to give you a nice table to look at that uh, in, inside of Google Classroom itself. So that's going to be a really great update. When it comes, I tried just today again to see if I could find any update on a timeline and it just still says later this year. So maybe in the next 10 days, let's see. Um, so perhaps when you all come back from winter break, it'll be, it'll be there waiting for you. So, um, so those are two Google Classroom updates that are coming that are gonna be really cool. Very excited to see those come about uh, and, and hopefully, hopefully soon. So, um, you know, you just kind of a, a nice little tease uh, there on, on some updates there. But I wanted to make sure that we did include them uh, as we talked about them today. 
All right, so a lot of stuff, and I think one of the things that a lot of people here are, are really gonna be interested in are some new updates inside of Google Docs. This is where I would say a majority of some really new, awesome, interesting features come about. Now, some of these have been around for you know a couple of months, but I wanna make sure you know what you can maximize out of them. So you might've seen them, not really understood what they do, where they are, you know, how they work or what, you know, what, anything about them. So we wanna kind of explain them in a little bit more detail. Uh, and you know, just have some fun with it. So for this one, this is where if you are on a computer and you wanna play along, you can open up this Google Doc. Let me double check. I don't think I actually put the right copy on that. So let's double, let's see how that, oh, of course it's gonna open up for me. Okay, so you guys are all in there. So you'll have to make a copy of it. Um, yeah, you'll be able to view it. So you'll have to go file, make a copy. I apologize. Usually I put a force, make a copy on that, um, but you will have to go file. Uh, make a copy to be able to have your own uh, version of this. All of the things that we are going to talk about will still be in the slide deck. So kind of be kind of following along in the slides, but I'm actually going to present from the Google Doc uh, because I think it's more engaging to be actually to, to show this and, and to uh, kind of see it in action. So you know, if you want to open up the Google Doc and follow along, you're more than welcome to do that as well. All right, so one of the biggest updates to Google Docs, I love this update. I think this is one that when I've shown people this, their eyes have gotten big. They've been like, ooh, that's really cool. Like I could see some really good functionality with that. And in this document, you see we're thinking spring. I do not like winter. That is a well-known fact. If you know me, I despise the winter. Sometimes I don't know why I live in Illinois. Most of the winter, I don't know why I live in Illinois. Uh, but I love spring. I love summer and I love fall. So that's probably why I'm still here. And I love being warm. And so when we look at this, like we wanna think spring, not think winter. So I've skipped a, a season here since winter started today. We're gonna to go start thinking spring. So we're gonna go into our Google Doc. This is something we might share with our kids, you know, something like that. But, you know, we wanna ask them, make a checklist of the first things that you're gonna do uh, when the temperature rises above 50 degrees on a weekend. So what are some of those activities that you might do on that first spring weekend, or actually just on Christmas Eve, because it's supposed to be super warm in two days. Um, but we're going to think about that in the, the fall. So here's what we're looking at. Up here, we can make a list, you know, we could add even bullets in and just say, I, I will definitely be playing golf, that's for sure. Um, I will probably do some uh, some winter cleanup of the yard or spring cleanup of the yard, we'll call it. And then I will, let's see, what's another thing I like to do? Well, I'm gonna, mm, we don't usually mow on the, we'll just, we'll just go for a nice walk. Or we'll, okay, we'll say go for a hike. We like to do that in our family. So we've made a list, but we haven't actually followed the definition here of making a checklist. We've made a list and we've put it into bullet points. Um, and what I want to do is show you guys that actually, if you just highlight this list, and it doesn't have to be bulleted either. I just use that because that's what a lot of people would, would initially like think to do. But what we can do is we can go right to the left of the bullet point option. And now we have a new option here called checklist. And this is super cool because it's interactive. So when you click the checklist option, now you can see you get these little boxes that come up next to your items and they're different than what you might have seen if you would have gone with a, a bulleted list because you do have like the option here for boxes. But what we do is when we put it into a checklist, we can actually go through and we can interactively click the boxes and it strikes through uh, whatever's on that list. So this is a nice way that you can actually put in a list of things inside of a Google Doc, maybe a task list at the top of a Google Doc, or you know something for your students, they can keep track of the options that they're supposed to do inside of an activity, and then they can actually have that interact, and you can have that check off here. So that's a really cool update, one that I think is just amazing for like keeping track of tasks, for keeping track of organizing your Google Doc. Uh, it's a really cool thing. So again, that exists up in your menu bar, up here at the top. All right, so I see Heather has already asked an incredibly difficult question uh, about Chrome updates and things like that. Heather, thanks for that. <laughs> I know Heather, so I guess this is good. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I am not uh, sure why that would be. We can maybe connect on that offline or well, online, but off of this call. We might be able to dig deeper into that because I don't know off the top of my head why that would uh, why that would happen. I know the last Chrome update did cause some hiccups with uh, 
some other things I was told. I'm not, you know, some things weren't playing nice and sometimes that's a thing where they've updated Chrome and then the third party app developer hasn't caught up with the new Chrome update yet. Um, but I don't, I don't know for, for, for sure on that. So, um, all right. So that's your, uh, back to our Google doc here. So that's our first one here. Now the next one down here, Okay, so like we want to think about different temperatures. So I actually ask people to put in the chat, like what's your favorite temperature in the spring? Like when it gets to that, like we'll say like mid-March and you hit like that weekend, that first warmish weekend where we come out of February and you're like, I'm outside, like I have to do it. Like what's that temperature like? So if you want to drop that in the chat, uh, if you're able to, what's your favorite like first spring, spring timey feel weekend? Like for me, it's like right about that 50, 55 degree mark where I'm like, let's go, let's get out there. All right, so Matt says 68, Heather's got it coming in at 50. So this is cool, because what we're gonna do here, we've got Beth at 65, all great temperatures, right? Like, and it's amazing too how our body's like, oh yeah, 50, 65, that's really warm. And yet if that was that case in July, we'd be like sweatshirts, hoodies, this is cold. Um, Amy, 55, I'm with you, that's where I'm at. I'm, you know, I'm kind of run that warm blooded, like as soon as it comes, 50 degrees, I'm outside, shorts, sweatshirt, like bring it on. But uh, anyways, so here's what we can do is we can actually create a table inside of Google Docs. It's not new, like we've been able to do that forever. But one of the things that we can do is now we can make this a little bit more informational if we share this document with people. Okay, so like up here, I'm gonna actually gonna share this with Matt. Matt should already have access to this. Okay, but I'm gonna share with this. And I have Heather actually right up at the top here too and I know I have Beth actually as well so we're gonna share this with all of you I'm gonna not bother you guys with uh, email notifications here um, so I'm gonna uncheck that but I'm gonna share this with you guys and one of the things that's kind of neat about this is now we have this introduction in Google Docs to what are called smart chips okay so a smart chip now is something that Google wants to create kind of the next evolution of a Google Doc so they're actually starting they started this out with like a thing called smart compose where if you started typing, it started suggesting words that you should do. It's actually made me become like a little bit smarter of a writer, right? Because it's like, you should use this word. And you're like, oh yeah, I should. But they're gonna start calling a Google Doc like the smart canvas, okay? So it's this thing that's like really interactive and allows you to like really fully understand or like interact with other people. So for example, like we've got Matt here on the table. I can actually put the at sign in. And then from here, I can start looking for Matt. So if I start typing in his name, you can see the people come up here. And then when I click on his name, he now has this little chip kind of around him. And you might say, well, what's the point of that? Well, if you hover over top of his name now, you can see I have access to quickly see, get his email address. I can send him an email. I can start a chat with him. I could even start a video call or I can go to schedule an event with him. So if I'm working collaboratively with Matt in this document, I have the ability to connect with him without having to like jump over to Gmail, jump over to calendar, jump over to chat, it's all can be done kind of through a link right here. And then now I can just, you know, fill out his name here. So Matt said uh, 68 was his. Okay, so then we'll just, uh, since we shared this already with Heather, we can go at Heather, there she is. She, she goes into a smart chip. She was at 50 and then Beth as well. And it doesn't have to be people that you are like share the document with, you can actually put smart chips in of people that aren't in the document. And they they will get, if you want them to have access to it, it'll suggest it to you. You're like, hey, do you wanna give access to this person? But it doesn't actually have to, you can just put this in and what'll be, what'll happen is you can just, you know, have them in there and then you have their kind of contact information right there directly. Now it, it should be somebody that you've interacted with in the past. So if I don't have, like, I don't have Amy, I might have Amy's contact information, I don't know, but I don't have Amy's contact information, I don't think I do right now. So if I did an at and then look for Amy, Amy Jackson, it's probably not gonna pop up because I haven't interacted with her before, but I've interacted with Beth, I've interacted with Heather, and I've interacted with Matt before. So all their stuff come in like they would pop up normally in a Gmail if I was composing that. So it's kind of cool because now I have access to uh, be able to get to their information uh, should I choose to want it all right there. So those are the smart chips with contacts, um, which is pretty neat. Now we're gonna do some more information with smart chips kind of further down the document, but that's one thing that's pretty cool. Now, another thing in tables, while we're at it, I'm actually going to jump back over into the document because this is something that is, or into my slides, this is something that is not yet available, but they are coming out with uh, table templates. 
Okay, so again, something they've kind of promised, there's one table template that's available right now, it's called meeting notes. But other than that, some of the other things aren't quite there yet. So for example, you can look in this GIF. One of the things that is coming is gonna be this ability to actually include an interactive like voting system in your Google Doc, where people are gonna be able to thumbs up uh, you know, different things. So again, smart canvassing, this type of thing. So you can see here, we've got like book title, author, and then who do you want? Maybe you can have the kids vote on what book they wanna read next. And they all have access to it, they can click on this, and then you can have a voting system or a polling system directly in that table. So that's gonna be a table template. Again, not there yet. Um, they announced that several months ago. So we're still, again, one of those things where we're kind of like waiting for it to come out. Uh, but that is gonna be really cool when that comes. Now, should you wanna look for those? Those are gonna be in the insert option. And then right now they're actually living underneath the building blocks. Okay, so right now you can see there's the meeting notes one here. And this is actually pretty cool. I'll go down to the bottom here and kind of show you what it looks like. So when I go to insert the building block, of the meeting notes, it's gonna ask me for a, uh, an event. So what's an event? So we're, gonna opt we're supposed to update the PD catalog and Sam and I are gonna have a conversation about that. So I'm gonna click on that. And you notice now it gives me the date, the meeting title, and then who the attendees are. So it's Sam and I already, and then it gives me notes and then automatically a checklist for action items. So it's kind of cool. Like it just like, boom, creates this whole little template for me to then build my kind of meeting notes off of, uh, which is pretty, pretty sweet. Um, and again, there's supposed to be more of these coming out. They just haven't released them yet. So it's coming soon. I feel like a kind of a, an infomercial guy right now, like soon, coming soon, you know, but here we are. All right. So the next thing. So one of the things that is pretty cool about uh, this newer newer updates to Google Docs as well is the interactivity with images. So previously inserting an image into a Google Doc was kind of a pain because it just didn't really flow all that well and you could wrap it around text or you could put it in line and they were they were a bit bit wonky to use. They still are, but there's a new option inside of here that I think is really a cool one. Um, you can actually type over top of images now. So when we want to insert an image into our Google Doc, so we're just going to search the web for one here. And we'll do a very generic uh, search here for springtime flowers. Oh, we'll just do springtime, how about that? There we go. So we've got some nice pictures here, some nice flowers. So we'll take that, we'll insert that in. You can see it just comes in really big, disrupts my entire Google Doc here. What we'll do is we'll kind of shrink it so we can manage it a little bit better. And then now we also have some new options. So down here, we still have our ability to put it in line, have it wrap the text. You can also have it break the text, which means it just kind of floats around and it kind of takes up just a lot of different spaces. But there are two new options here too, which are behind text and in front of text. And so if it's in front of text, and you want to break the text. Now what you can do is you can actually move this and you can put it in front of different text options, which is kind of cool. The other thing that we can do is we can put it behind the text. So in this case, if we put it behind the text, you can have it be essentially your background of your Google Doc, or you could have your students type on top of it, uh, which is kind of cool. I like to think of it as a way to put a really cool background behind your Google Doc. So maybe you're creating like a newsletter to send out to your parents um, or other stakeholders, whoever you might do that. You wanna put a really neat background on, that's really cool. Now you see like, you're like, yeah, Ben, that's neat, except you can't read any of the text. That is a problem. So let me show you uh, a, a quick trick on that. We're gonna go up here when the image is selected to image options. And then over on this side, you can actually use things like an adjustment which then gives you some options to adjust the transparency. And this is where this is a key component of this, like making the image part of the background, is you wanna adjust this transparency up. And so as I do that, now you can see the text becomes far more legible than what it was before. And I can kind of play with that transparency to a point where it doesn't over, perhaps the image doesn't then overpower the text that's on the screen. And so now if I click anywhere, uh, in the document, I'm able to continue to type. Oh, 
without having the image, you know, be moving around or anything like that. So it's, it's a nice new option. Um, you can also adjust those same features. So you saw I was able to do that from down here. Um, you can also fix it to the position on the page, which is helpful because then if I just say, nope, I want it to just be like right there. That's where I want it to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can kind of manipulate with this. You can also go into the image options over here. And this is where we can also adjust a lot of different stuff, including the option for the text wrapping. So you can do that from this menu down here, but you can also see it in kind of a larger scale and what that looks like inside of the image options here. So really a neat way to kind of spice up a Google Doc. Um, you know, if your kids want to put an image into a Google Doc and then type on top of it for added context, they're able to do that now as well. Uh, so it's not just about the background. Like it's a, it's a little bit more than that. So that is a, a fun update that I think is, is pretty neat in how we use uh, images inside of Google Docs. All right, so we're gonna do another smart chip. Okay, so this time we're gonna look at YouTube videos. Okay, so uh, one of the things with YouTube videos is, you know, when we open up a YouTube video, so let's go to our YouTube channel, let's go to our YouTube here, let's find one. You never know what comes up in your suggested uh, YouTube videos. So far, so good, okay, not too bad. Hey, there's a LTC video. Uh, we're gonna use the SpaceX one though. So we're gonna take this SpaceX, um, option here let's see we're going to now take the link okay so inside of youtube one of the things that i like to show people you can grab this link up at the top um, obviously you can do that but one of the things i always like is i like to go down to the share uh, often that's because if i've watched a video before youtube remembers where i left off uh, because of the cookies that they collect and so up here this might actually have an option that says t equals and then a number which would then timestamp where I left off. So if I took this link up here and it had that in it, and I pasted that into the Google Doc for my kids to watch, they would start at whatever time I left off and that would be confusing. It might start them right in the middle of the video. So I like to show people, when you wanna share a YouTube video, the best place to grab the link is from down below the video here where it says share. Then you get a nice clean link here that you can copy and then paste into whatever platform you're pasting it into. You can still actually use the start at option and put in like I want it to start at five minutes if that's what you wanted to do. You can do that from this part here, but this just gives you a nice clean shorter link usually to the YouTube video. So from that, we're gonna grab that link, go back into our Google Doc. This has nothing to do with springtime rituals. Maybe my springtime ritual is watching astronauts blast, it, blast off into space. I don't know, it's actually kind of fun, but I'm gonna paste that in. Now, a couple of things come up right away. The first thing is that you notice it asks you, because Google is intelligent, hit the tab button to replace with, and then this information here, CRS24 mission, which is the video title for the YouTube video. So if I hit tab on that, what that's going to do is that's going to automatically create a smart chip of that YouTube video. So instead of having that long, ugly YouTube link in there, you have now a cleaner looking smart chip that then shows what the video is when you hover over top of it and then gives you the link that you can click on and go right to that video if you wanted to. So that's nice because it allows you to kind of clean up your Google Doc, makes it look a little bit more professional, gives it really that like nice clean technology look to it instead of the really long ugly link, okay? The other thing that you can do is if you paste that link in again, so let's do that one more time. And then you just don't, if you don't hit tab, you maybe forget, you just hit the, the pay, you just hit space. You have this ugly link. If you click on that link here, you notice that down here at the bottom, it says replace URL with the chip. You can click on that. And now you've got your smart chip as well. So that's, a, that's just another way that you can add the YouTube smart chip in there. Okay. So couple of different ways that you can do that. Now, here's the big thing with YouTube videos. There's no ability to embed a video into YouTube or into a Google Doc yet. Like I imagine that's gonna be coming, but not right now. You can embed a video into a form, you can embed video into Google Classroom, you can embed it into Google Slides, but you can't embed it into a Google Doc. So if your kids wanted to have to maybe watch this video and fill out questions in a Google Doc, they would have to open it up in a new tab and bounce back and forth. Kind of a pain. Here's the trick though. If you hover over top of the smart chip 
and then down where it has this window, there's an option here that says open preview. And if you do that, you actually get the YouTube video in a window inside of your Google Doc. So we can skip ahead here and mute that. So now I've got the video playing and while the video is playing, I can still type and watch the video at the same time. So now my students are able to watch the video and answer questions or take notes on the video in the Google Doc without having to bounce around from tab to tab. So that's a really crucial, I think, like component of using Google Docs and YouTube videos together is knowing that your kids can use though that open preview option and have it play in the Google Doc while they're editing their Google or have it play basically in the bottom right hand corner of the Google Doc while they're editing the Google Doc. Now that preview option too, if you open that up and they say, you know, what, I really want to see that as a larger in a larger screen, they can hit this little shortcut button and then it'll open it up in the full tab. So it's not like they're restricted to, you know, watching it in that little bitty corner window. But that's just a really nice way that your kids can have the YouTube video going and edit the Google Doc all at the same time. All right. So that's that is our smart chips there. I'm, you know, if you have questions like please drop them in the chat, you know, as we're as we're going. We're going to have one more or one more smart chip uh, as we go here too. So there's another smart chip further down the road. Um, but the next thing I want to put in here is we want to look at another newer Google feature that is really pretty awesome. And that is the ability to include in-text citations inside of your Google Doc. And this actually just got yet another update. So I was showing this to teachers like two weeks ago and I was like, oh, I really like this because it does this thing, which I'll show you here in a second. And then I opened it up and it had updated and it had gotten better, I think. Depends on who you ask. So let's look at it. So we want to find an article. So let's find an article on um, spring cleaning. How to clean the windows in the spring. A revolutionary window or article. This is. You can literally find it. Bob Vila. I mean, who better to ask about how to clean your windows than Bob Vila? Actually, we're asking, it looks like Donna Boyle Schwartz and Bob Vila. So together, we've got Donna and Bob helping us out on our how to clean windows here. So I'm going to look at this as if I'm a kid, I'm doing research. I say, you know what? This is like just a really good thing here. I want to like take this. Let's see, here's this one right here. So we are going to copy this because we are like any good kid. We're just gonna copy and we're gonna go back to our Google Doc and we're gonna paste that in. Okay, so we've got our Google, you know, our text pasted in. Okay, so now we have to cite that. Okay, so what we're doing is we gotta make sure we cite Donna and Bob appropriately. So this is where Google has inside of the tools menu now an option for citations. Okay. This is a huge update. Like, I mean, like I can't express how awesome this update is because as a former high school history teacher, I didn't have time to teach my kids how to cite things appropriately. So often what I would kind of, you know, hand up, I did, I just said, guys, just paste the link at the bottom of the page or in a footnote or create a quick bibliography with the links. And that's good enough. I didn't teach them, you know, MLA because they were going to learn that in English class. And so, you know, I didn't want to steal any thunder and I didn't have time to do it anyways. What this is going to afford teachers the opportunity to and any educators that are going back for continuing education, as Heather just put in the chat, where was that at when you're getting your master's? 100% agree. When you click on citations, you now can choose between the three most popular citation formats, AMLA, APA, and Chicago author date. So that's for us history nerds. Uh, we had to do Chicago style. Um, you know, and then, you know, that was always fun, right? As a history teacher or history major and your ed major, like all your education papers written in APA, all your history stuff written in Chicago. Great. You get to learn two. Um, we're going to go with an APA formatting here. So what we can do is we look at APA. So we're going to delete one from before. And we're going to look at APA here. We're going to say add a citation source. Good one, Brian. <laughs> uh, dad joke for the win there. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so your source type here, 
So we're going to look at it. We, we picked a website. We accessed it from a website. Now, here is the new update. Okay, so previously, what happened, and this is what I liked about this, is it didn't do it automatically. What it did was it forced the students, and this is where I would encourage my kids, and obviously not all of them are going to do it, but I would encourage my kids to choose site manually. Because what this does is it now asks them to go through and find the authors. So like we would say, here's the author. So then we'd have to go back to the website. We would then have to evaluate, okay, who's the author? Donna Schwartz and Bob Vila. So for this one, we're just going to use Bob Vila because that's much quicker to type. And then we're going to take the title, how to clean windows. Or drop that in here. You could have added, see, I could have added Donna in here as well, just for the sake of time. I'm not going to. The house title or the website title is bobvila.com, or it's just Bob Vila, I guess. The URL, we're going to grab that. So you can see what this is forcing me to do as a student is actually evaluate the website. Like, is this a good website? Who is the author? When was this article published? It was updated on August 9th of 2021. So obviously we've got the newest and best window washing information here as we are looking at it. And now we access it on all these days. I'm not going to fill any of that out, but you can see what this does is it allows a student to evaluate the website. Part of being a good digital citizen, part of making sure they're acting appropriately on the internet and evaluating sources. This is what I liked about it because it forced them to still put in all the information themselves. And then when you say add citation source, now it gives you the citation. And then you're saying like, well, what about the in-text citation? Well, this is where it's pretty cool because then you can hit wherever your cursor's at. So my cursor is right next to the stuff I quoted. I can hit cite and it drops in the in-text citation directly into the Google Doc. And then if maybe I took something else from up here, I can hit cite and it'll drop it in. So it's pretty cool. And then now what you can do is you can actually go through and you can look at, let's add one more source just for fun. So let's go to a different article on bobvila.com here. Let's see, uh, let's get some ideas. Uh, the handy helpers, nine handy helpers and make the best stocking stuffers. Absolutely. We got to know what Bob likes or in this case, Glenda. Um, so this is the new way. So I've not really played with this yet. Um, we're going to add another source. We're going to add a website and then we are going to search with the URL. So this is the new way that you can do it. And this is the way where you can see it does it automatically for the student. So this is where I'm kind of like, eh, I don't know. I like the old way, but like I get the convenience of this. If I was writing a paper, I would totally do the convenient way, but I want my kids to evaluate the sources. So it's kind of up to you on how you want to use this, right? But you can see it gives the title, the website title, the URL, when, the pub when it was published, when we accessed it and who the author was just like that and now we can say all right continue there all it is add the source bada bing bada boom Can't get that on my screen okay we have the new one here that we can now go through type something else in we can hit site and it adds in the next article and these all save with your document here okay so does it change the ones with several authors to at all after the first text citation? That's a great question, Heather. I don't know. Uh, I haven't thankfully had to write a paper in a long time. So um, not sure on that one. That would be a good, I'm guessing because it does have the uh, ad contributors at the bottom that perhaps it does that. Um, but here's the last thing with this is once you're finished with this and you want to put in a reference page, you can see down at the bottom here, insert references. And when you do that, now it drops in a reference page with your references. So now I've had some teachers go through and kind of nitpick it where they're like, oh, there's a, they're missing a couple of commas here and things like that. I mean, yeah, you probably want to go back through and like proof it, especially if you're turning it in for homework. But like, as far as like, I'm concerned in education world as a history teacher, this is awesome because it's caused my kids to cite sources, to evaluate sources and put in and teaches them at least the basics on citing things. And that's what I want as a history teacher, as an MLA or as a, a language arts teacher, you might want to go a little bit deeper, okay, and teach them maybe see like, are there things that are wrong with this, you know, that's all up to you. But I think this is a really nice option 
uh, for our students to be able to, to cite stuff. And like I said, for us too, as uh, continuing educators, if we have to do that. You can see if I close this out and then I go back to tools and citations, they're still there. So they don't go anywhere, which is really nice as you're uh, continuing to build on uh, content. So, all right. So those are our kind of newer uh, citation, you know, things. Again, that's been out for a, for a little bit, but like it's just one of those things, the new update to it with the automatically generated citations is something that I think everybody should be aware of. All right, there we go, I got that out of the way. Okay, so here's our next thing, okay? So when we're gonna look at a new update in Google Chrome, okay? We've only got a couple more things and then we'll kind of turn everybody loose to go celebrate the beginning of darkness uh, on the winter solstice. Um, but what we have is we've got a new update in Google Chrome that I think is one of those ones that's new. I haven't started taking advantage of it as much as I should yet um, because it's new and it's like kind of hidden, but I think it's got a lot of potential, okay? And that's the ability that inside of Google Chrome, what you're able to do is group tabs. So if you're a person that gets really tabalicious and you get a ton of tabs up at the top of your screen and they're all over the place and you need to organize them because you can't, heaven forbid, you closed them out and you had to find them again. Like you need those tabs open, okay? Which there are many people out there, many teachers especially out there that have this problem. So what you can do is now if I go up to my tab, so I have three tabs up here that are all about spring. Okay, so they all have a consistent theme, they're all together. What I can do is I can right click on one of them. And then now I have all these different options. And if you've never right clicked on a tab before, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do, like mute your site or pin the tab. Um, you can even send it to different devices. If your phone's open, you can actually airdrop it over to it. It's super cool. It'll open it up in Chrome. You have to have Chrome, but it'll open it up. Really nice. Anywho, what we're looking at here is adding the tab to a group. Okay, so when I add the tab, I'm going to add the tab to a new group. Now I'm going to name the group. So we'll call it spring. You can give it a different color. We'll take a kind of a nice purple that reminds us of purple flowers in springtime, right? And then what we do now is we go to the other tabs. We right click on them and we say now add tab to group. We'll say spring and then we'll say spring. And you can see the purple line is kind of collectively grouping these three tabs together. And then now the power of this is maybe we're not working on the springtime project right now. So what you can do is you can click on spring and it'll reduce all of those tabs down to just this one thing here. And then you can open it back up, close it, open it up. You can even right click where it says spring. And you can say move group to new window and it'll pull all those tabs out from the other tabs that you have open on that and give it its own window that you can use. So it's really cool. Um, you know, you can group these things together. So this is like a nice way you can maybe group your productivity tools together. So you open up Gmail, Calendar, Drive, uh, Chat, if you're using the, the Chat wild browser menu, and you can open them all up and then you can group those together and just kind of have that group available throughout the course of today uh, or of the day. It's really a neat option. now. Here's the one bummer with this. Like it's cool, but there's one little bummer. And that's if I close the window out, the groups don't save. So you can't like have them grouped and then every morning be like, oh, I'm gonna open up my productivity group. And it's just automatically there. There is a tool out there. It's a Chrome extension called OneTab uh, that does that. I found it to be a little bit wonky from time to time and not super reliable to save my groups uh, of group tabs. Um, so that's the one thing I'm waiting for them to like innovate next is the ability to save these groups. Cause then I could see like every day, just you're just opening up that those groups and you're saving those groups and it can be really helpful. But it is really a nice thing to like organize. And if you teach this to your kids of being able to like organizing like the stuff that they're working on you know, and, and all that. I think that could be really helpful too, because the colors are nice. The colors are nice to be able to kind of dictate, you know, what you're uh, what you're working with there. So a really awesome kind of update uh, to be able to to look at. So yeah, Heather, that's kind of what I'm thinking too. Yep, 
Yep, exactly, with the pin tabs as well. If you've never pinned a tab before, okay, what a pin tab is, if you right click on your tab and then you say to pin, what it does is it just shortens it down to this little bitty guy here, okay? And then what that allows you to do is just not have a whole bunch of wide tabs open. Now, the other question I get from this too is, if I group the tabs and then I minimize the group like that, does that mean that then the, like Chrome starts sucking, stops sucking up all the processing power of my computer? It doesn't. Like it still runs hot. Like if you have a billion tabs open, your PC is going to run at a really tremendously high rate, um, or your MacBook. Like it's going to, it's it's still taking a lot of processing power. So you're not like putting them to sleep or anything. Uh, but it does at least clean your view up a little bit, which is nice. Okay. So that is our uh, our uh, Google Chrome kind of update uh, to share, and we are getting close uh, to to being out of time, but we're we're almost there. Oh, I like that suggestion, Matt. That's a good one. Yeah, save save the tab to a group to a bookmarks bar and create a folder like all at once of all of them. Like that would be awesome. Yeah, we should work at Google and just like sit, have these ideas and then make other people do them. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, best job ever. <laughs> hey you smart programming guy make it do this <laughs> that's all that would be good um okay so our last two things here uh that we have and i want you guys if you would like to try this you've, if you've used google forms in the past you've probably or if your students have been using forms this semester you've already seen this in action so we don't have to spend a ton of time on it but if you open this google form up uh, one of the things that I'd like you guys to do and to see that is really neat is that Google Forms auto saves. Okay, so if your student um, is taking a Google Form and they accidentally close the tab out, the form will automatically reopen at the point with all their information that has already been inputted saved. So for example, we're in my thinking spring. If I start typing my name, I want you to look at this little cloud right here. Okay, we start typing it in. You can see it says saving, then I can, you know, just start choosing different options here. And then it's like, oh no, like I closed it out somehow, or my Chromebook died, or like Heather says, like they run out of time in class, like, you know, something happens, that's bad. Well, if they open that back up, as long as they have the link still, it saves like a shadow copy of the form in their Google Drive. They don't have access to it in their Google Drive. Like they can't go back and find it, but like they can just have, like it saves this, saves this kind of shadow in the shadow world of, uh, of Google Forms. They're a copy. So you can see I open that back up and all of my responses are still there. Well, I guess this one didn't actually get, end up getting saved. But uh, if I close that out again, so I did a control shift T to open it back up. Now I go back. And if I just click on the link here to open this up, all of my answers still come back, which is really nice. So you think about those kids that need extended time on assessments, that start filling a form out, and then the bell rings, they got to go up to the special education teacher's room to fill it out. They close their Chromebook, Chromebook dies, Chromebook closes all the tabs out, something weird happens, they get up there, oh no, all their stuff's gone. Nope, they'll still be here. Um, one of the things that was uh, asked when I was showing this to some teachers was, what about locked mode on Chromebooks? So when you send a quiz out through Google Classroom, you can engage locked mode, which then locks the student's screen out to just the Google form. And so one of the things that was you know, addressed or question was like, well, if they save their answers and then they exit the locked mode, look it up, and then they get back into the form, does it still save their answers? And the answer to that is yes, it does. Um, but that being said, uh, you get a notification when a kid leaves a locked quiz. So if they leave and come back in, you know about it. So it's not like they can just get, this is their way around like the locked form. Like you're gonna get notified that the kid left and then joined and then left and then joined. And so you're gonna be able to see that, you're gonna get time stamped on that, you're gonna get notified of it. So it's not like there's, that's the way around uh, the locked form. So, so just some really cool stuff. Uh, you know, I, I really think this is something that is, is great for students uh, in that. And then the other thing inside of Google Classroom or in Google Forms that is new is that you've probably noticed the settings tab is moved. So it used to be up the top in the gear wheel. Now it's just here. I like this a lot better. It's just all laid out. 
you know, it's in these little drop down arrows that you can kind of see and manage different things. So I think this is a much better view uh, rather than, uh, you know, the, the settings window. Also, we get undo and redo buttons up at the top too, which are super helpful. Uh, still no revision history, uh, you know, in a form, which would be nice if Google gave us that. Again, one of our ideas that we can get paid for to work for them. Um, but maybe someday they'll, they'll come up with that for us. So, so really some good stuff inside of Google Forms uh, for us here. So uh, just quickly, I'm going to go back because we are about out of time. I want to be conscious of everybody's time here. Um, the Google Slides updates. Okay, so we're just going to kind of go through this uh, in presentation mode here. Okay, so the Google Slides update, and this is our, our colleague Eric uh, put, created this GIF and put it in, uh, runs at a bit of a quick pace. But what this does is you can actually put in the template mode, uh, so it's called edit theme. Okay, so if you want to edit the theme of your Google Slideshow, you can put in image placeholders now, which are really cool. So as you can see, he's editing the theme, and then now when he opens up the slide deck, he's able to see an oval there that asks him to add his picture right away. So these are image placeholders, which I think are really a nice option for like creating templates for kids that have to put pictures into slides. Like they can now, you can create those kind of in the back end and the kids know exactly where to go to put those pictures in. And they just have to click on the template there to begin to put it in there and it's there. They don't have to insert image or hit the image icon or anything like that. Yeah, Heather, like a wax museum, exactly. Okay, so that's a really cool update. Uh, Gmail's got a couple of updates now too. So if people send you pictures through Gmail, you're able to save them directly to your Google Photos now, which is kind of fun. Google Sheets has some updates, nothing really like glamorous inside of a Google Sheet update here. Um, but one of the things that is there is that it does allow you to look at comments inside of a Google Sheet more broadly. Uh, before they were always kind of hidden and like hard to find and you didn't know where they were at. Now you can kind of filter them out and look at them across all the sheets. So if you're a power user of sheets and you have lots of comments that are inside of them, your ability to uh, filter through different comments and through different sheets is going to be a much easier option now. Um, and also, if you want to like apply uh, different color codes or things to Google Sheets, you can select multiple sheets all at the same time and you can apply those things, which is super cool. Okay, so that's one that's kind of like, again, nothing like super glamorous in the Google Sheet world, but just a couple of neat updates. Google Sites. So this is one that I really like is that you have the ability to now create templates inside of Google Sites and share them with your domain. So you've been able to do this with docs and with uh, forms and with sheets and with slides. Now you're able to do it with Google Sites. And one of the things that I think teachers are going to be able to create now it are digital portfolios and we can template out that digital portfolio. So every kid's digital portfolio has the same formatting to it. And so what you can do is you can create that digital portfolio template in Google sites, submit it as a template into the template gallery. And you can see right here where it says LTC, that would be one that then the kids can click on and they can find it, open it up and all of the template is there for uh, that kid, the site's already built. It looks the same. Heather's looks the same as Beth, which looks the same as Matt's, which looks the same as Brian's. Like, and they can just build off of that. Um, so the template gallery in Google Sites is going to be a really cool option uh, for our students uh, to, to create that. So um, with that, let me just kind of look through here. The one Chromebook update, this is kind of on the nerdier side. Um, you can create, uh, this has to be turned on by your admins. So that's why I said it's on the nerdier side. But there is a pinned login now for littles, uh, which, well, it's for everybody, but it's really helpful for littles. So instead of typing in a long password, they can actually remember a numerical code now and type that in, and they can get logged into their Chromebook a little bit quicker, which is pretty cool. And then the last thing we're going to do is calendar updates. And I'm actually going to go into my calendar here so you can kind of see what this looks like, because there is a couple of really cool options inside of Google Calendar. Now, um, over here on the left hand side, it's going to give you insights into your week, not something that kids are going to use, um, something that admins, I think, might use a little bit more. Uh, but what's cool is like you can look at your insights and it'll actually show you like how your time has been broken down. Like when did you when were you in meetings that week? Like if we go back to this week uh, while I was on vacation, so I didn't really do anything that week. Um, hard to find a busy week here lately. So you can see. When did I have a meeting of three or more guests? How much time was I in that one for? 
How much time did I spend in these meetings? Who did I meet with the most? Um, you know, so it's just kind of a cool thing that you can kind of see your different insights into your calendar meetings. Um, there is also the ability now you can use Google Maps a little bit easier inside of uh, a Google Calendar event. So you can actually look for different options, see the exact location, see the map pop up. Some really interesting new ways of engaging with uh, Google Calendar. And then the last thing that I'll kind of point out before we call this uh, quits for the night um, is that you can actually say inside of a calendar event now how you're going to join that event. This is one that I think is huge in our age of virtual work and hybrid work. Um, you can say when you click on the yes option, there's a little drop down here. You can say yes, and then I'm going to attend in a meeting room or I'm going to attend virtually. And then that notifies the host whether or not you're going to actually be there or if you're going to be on the call. So they can have the room set up appropriately. So this is a really neat option. I think it's going to take people time to like adjust that this is a thing that they can actually do. But man, it would be really helpful for in this age of hybrid work for us to be able to have that kind of, in, you know, that notification of who's showing up and who's joining via the Google Hangout or, or I'm sorry, the Google Meet uh, or the Zoom. So just a couple of really cool updates to calendar there. All right, and with that, we're done. So uh, I hope you guys found that to be helpful. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me until 4.30 on like a day that's probably really close to your Christmas breaks. Uh, and, uh, you know, enjoy your holidays. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys all next time in the next year. Because you got to make that joke, like, see you next year. <laughs> you know, that's what everybody's saying now, right, Matt? <laughs> right. Well, hey, Ben, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us today and sharing your love of Google and your hatred of winter with us. Um, <laughs> Did that come across both of those things? I yeah, I kind of I kind of got <laughs> kind of got the question there. Um, so, uh, folks, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to share those in the chat um, or in the Q and A. And um, uh, as we let Ben take a breath here for just a moment, we'll uh, uh, give you an opportunity to um, share your questions if you'd like. Yep. Okay. Yes, Heather, go ahead. I'm going to try to stump you again. <laughs> right. Done it once before. So it's only with the extension that I cannot put in the GIFs. Like if I go to the website, it works, but I can't click and drag it. I can't use the code they give me. It has to be from the website or it doesn't work. I've done this on my personal account. I've done this on my school account. I did it on another teacher's account. I've done it on school computers. I've done it on my computer. I've, I, I'm stumped. <laughs> it just says on, what was it? Unsupported file type. So the, so as I kind of think about that, one of the things that I've found is sometimes GIFs get too big and then they don't work. So I've had that happen in self-created GIFs where I've made a GIF using like uh, Camtasia uh, and then download it as a GIF and then it just doesn't work because it's too big. Like the file is too big um, to be supported. So that could be the issue. Now, if it's every GIF and like that could be a right. more, then I think it's like a, I think it's just a, a third party issue. Like the extension's probably just not like collaborating with or cooperating with the update. Um, but that unsupported file type I have seen and with a gift it's irritating and it's red <laughs> so yeah i just think you gotta just not save yourself the frustration and just not use the extension then for a while like uh, my advice so. fine i'll be boring for a while <laughs> or take download drag and drop <laughs> if there are any other questions please feel free drop them in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know what's on your mind Okay. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, since it is so close to the holidays, I'm sure everyone is anxious to get on with their uh, activities. So uh, just a quick reminder to everyone. First of all, thank you very much for spending some time with us today to learn with Ben and learn a little bit about Google. Uh, brief reminder that for those of you attending live, um, you'll receive an email from uh, 
the LTC with an invitation to complete an evaluation. Uh, you must complete and submit that evaluation uh, in order to receive PD credit. Um, the recording will also be posted on YouTube uh, probably before the end of the day tomorrow because I'm going on vacation after that. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you have uh, need for further uh, professional learning, uh, feel free to contact Ben, contact myself, or visit uh, ltcillinois.org forward slash events forward slash webinars. We have our January uh, webinars uh, posted there already that you can sign up for. And we're also building out into later months as well. So uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, that's all for today. Ben, happy holidays. You too, Matt. Thanks, everybody. And hope to see you all back here in the webinars after the holidays. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you.